um, Ijumulana from Tanzania. They are going to be with us today. Now, let me tell you a little bit uh, about the webinar. The webinar it will be uh, available to uh, each one uh, of you and also to the community of medical geology through the consortium website. Uh, here on the first slide, you can see our website. You can actually uh, download uh, the, this uh, material for research and education purposes. The authors of this uh, presentation have authorized the consortium to upload this presentation in, the, uh, in our website. It's also going to be available in YouTube and also in Facebook as well. Uh, so you are uh, a, a, you will be able to download this if you need the, if you would like to use this material. Now let me give you a very quick overview of what the, this consortium is before we start with the uh, with the uh, with the presentation. Um, I also before that I want to mention to you a little bit about the format for this webinar. We will have two speakers today. And the, the, the presentation will last about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes. And then after that, we will open the discussion uh, for questions and for uh, comments and a, a, for a panel discussion at the end. So I hope that you can stay with us and that you can actually uh, have uh, a, a questions to, uh, and comments that you can share with uh, Prosen and, and Julian uh, after their presentation. So that's basically some of the logistics of how this webinar will work. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about the International Environmental Health Sciences Consortium. Uh, we are a group of scientists representing very uh, basically every corner of the of the world. Uh, the science goals is covers a wide range of both uh, environmental, natural, and occupational issues in in, uh, in medical sciences, public health, and geosciences. So we cover the areas dealing with environmental toxicology, public health and regulatory sciences, environmental epidemiology, uh, risk assessment, and of course we uh, the this consortium is also here to strengthen the development of medical geology, uh, the discipline of medical geology globally. Uh, uh, we provide consultation, research, curriculum development, and capacity building. Uh, and when I mention capacity building, what I mean by that is that we encourage and work together with colleagues across the globe to develop centers of excellence uh, on research on medical geology and environmental health. Uh, additionally, our, uh, uh, our vision as a, as a consortium of scientists is to foster uh, new approaches to the study of environmental and occupational related diseases. Uh, by definition, medical geology, for example, is uh, focused on natural events, natural uh, sources. Uh, our consortium is trying to strengthen and extend that mission by looking as well at occupational related uh, diseases. So in that regard, the consortium is, uh, let me see if I can advance this, looks into addressing issues from global impacts from different type of contaminants and pollutants. And one of the samples that we are working on is for example, looking at the issue of water contamination. And today you are going to listen to some of this uh, research that is being conducted uh, at this level uh, by Prosom and Ju Julian, uh, understanding the distribution of contaminants, geogenic contaminants in, in, in uh, uh, aquifer uh, systems. One of the samples that we are focused on is, for example, uh, on the issue of global contamination of um, all global exposure to arsenic, not only from drinking water, for also from other sources such as diet, uh, medical use of arsenic, as well as the presence of this element 
in, in, in the atmospheric dust, uh, as well as anthropogenic sources such as mining, uh, contaminated soils, and use of different type of uh, materials in which arsenic uh, has been used, has been uh, used as a, a component of those materials. So this is one of the samples that this consortium looks at. Um, today, one of the uh, areas that we have developed is looking at the, the research that many of our uh, colleagues are conducting in each one of these areas. And the, the uh, program that has been developed is looking at uh, an international seminar series and we bring together colleagues from all over the world to, to, be, to talk to us about their research uh, on these areas that I mentioned before. Uh, last year, we had a, 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 an excellent uh, group of speakers uh, from, uh, that address many issues from mineralogy to medical use of uh, a, a, a geological materials to the impact of geological events, uh, uh, as well as the uh, determining uh, risk uh, assessment or risk uh, uh, for exposure to uh, uh, contaminants such as uh, cadmium uh, and lead and mercury. Uh, we had two uh, great speakers in, uh, last year, Patricia Ventura from the University of Azores and uh, Claire Hauer uh, from the UK, who talked to us about the uh, the uh, impact of uh, the health impacts of uh, volcanic emissions, and we had uh, Anastasia from Russia talking to us about the medical use of some uh, minerals such as bio uh, bioshafite, and then Rufus Cheney, one of our colleagues from the US. Department of Agriculture, uh, formerly in the Department of Agriculture, Rufus talked to us about cadmium and the uh, health risk associated with cadmium. So today we have the, the, the honor and the privilege to start today our series for 2023 uh, on, uh, on this, uh, continue with this uh, international series. And we have two superb speakers today who are going to talk to, to us today about a very particular kind of tools that are being used today uh, to address the issue of geogenic contaminants in naturally contaminated aquifer systems. So we have today with us, we have the privilege today to have Dr. Julian uh, Ijumulana. Uh, Julian is a postdoc researcher and assistant professor at Das Islam at, uh, University in Tanzania. Uh, he works on the, uh, the transportation and geotechnical engineering department uh, of uh, the University of Tanzania. And he has, Julie, Julian has done uh, fantastic work look, uh, looking at the use of GIS and other a spatial uh, variability uh, uh, methodology to address geogenic contaminants in drinking water, particularly in Tanzania. And we have with us my dear friend for many, many decades and, and colleague, uh, Professor Prosum Patacharia. Uh, Prosum is a professor of groundwater chemistry at KTH Inten. Uh, the Royal Institute of Technology at the International Groundwater Arsenic Research Group in KTH uh, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, I mean, in Sweden. Uh, is, uh, uh, a, we are privileged to have both uh, of, of you here. Uh, Prosom is also, I want to let you know that Prosom is also a, a fellow of the uh, Geological Society of America uh, since 2012. And recently he became the GSA uh, International uh, Committee member. 
uh, covering the period of 2021 through 2025. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm delighted to have Prosum and Julian today uh, as our first speakers for 2023. And I will, uh, I look forward to uh, a, gra a great presentation and to share with you all the uh, advances that Prosum and Julian have done uh, through these years in this particular area of uh, spatial variability and the study of geogenic contaminants in drinking water. So Julian, Prosum, welcome. Uh, and the floor is, is yours. And thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to listen to you and to be here with us today. So thank you, Jose. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and then the floor is all yours, Prasad and, and Julian. And, and again, thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity to, to listen to your research. Thank you, Jose, for a for your fantastic um, introduction, both to IEHC as well as to this webinar series and to us. Thank you very much. And we are really privileged to be a part of this family. I would call it a family, this International Environment and Health Science Consortium, which is really a good connectivity, which connects environmental science to health science to overall the quality of life, which it matters. So, I mean, today we are going to speak about integrating the QGIS and the other GIS software and tools for addressing the different drinking water quality challenges in naturally contaminated aquifer systems. Together me, Professor Prusam Bhattacharya, and together and to Dr. Julian Ujimulana, we are in front of you. And we are representing, this is a part of the DAFWAT, the Sweden-Tanzania Bilateral Cooperation, which has been going on since 2015. And we are going to, towards the end of this phase of activity before the onset of the next collaboration period, which will start soon within this coming, the later half of the year. So without... So this uh, seminar we have actually dis grouped into th three parts actually. So I would like now hand over the floor to Dr. Julian Ujimala. Julian, you're good. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, I thank you, uh, the director of this consortium for this invitation and uh, for this opportunity. And I welcome you all participants to this uh, seminar. Uh, it is uh, all about sharing experience about the current uh, technologies uh, in the market for uh, data analysis, uh, which take into consideration about the location uh, in the overall processes of data analysis. So um, next. So uh, in this part, I will talk about the current state of knowledge in spatial sciences. Next. So the overall seminar is uh, grounded on these um, spatial sciences, uh, that is the current state of knowledge, uh, whereby we developed uh, 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 an approach, uh, which is all about description, exploration, and explain, or in other words, it's the D E square approach. Um, it's not a, a, a new concept, but it's just a, a simple method and the approach and the, when you follow it, you get new insights from the data. So uh, in this uh, seminar, we focus mainly on the drinking water quality, which is uh, basically has been uh, um, uh, described briefly by the director. Uh, but in this case, the main concept is on the geographical I mean, the geographical phenomena in the area of drinking water or hydrogeochemical studies. 
So in this case, um, the drinking water quality can be compromised by three uh, contaminants, uh, categories of contaminants, that is physical, bacteriological, chemical, uh, and bacteriological and the chemical contaminants. So um, basically in this case, you can apply and I mean, you can apply this approach in any of these uh, groups or categories. Uh, but the important concept here is on the what is the issue, and we will have a one case study which whereby we will describe in details about the uh, contaminants. Uh, uh, I mean, drinking water contaminated by fluoride, and the, the case study is in the rest. I mean, in Tanzania. So um, the main concept when we talk about the description is all about identification of what is the specific uh, geographical phenomena. And in this case, by ge ge uh, geographical ph phenomena, we consider that what we observe has the location. And in this case, the location matters. So um, by description, in this case, um, we have different methods and we try to use um, uh, the current uh, information from uh, published papers and the gray reports, but we combine them with GIS tools, which we will describe in details, together with the descriptive statistics. And of course, in this case, we try to generate different descriptive statistics at different scales. And by so doing, we get insights. But the uniqueness of this approach is that we try to locate the statistics, uh, I mean, to put the statistics on the map. For example, looking at what is the minimum and where is it located? Uh, what is the maximum and where, where, where is it located? What is the median? And where is it located in space? So in this case, we answer the question of where through uh, what we call the explore, exploration. And in this case, also we try to use uh, different GIS tools, which we we'll, uh, uh, describe today, but we combine with what we call the exploratory data, spatial data analysis. We'll describe this as well, but what is important we try to identify the patterns or we try to identify the values which have extreme uh, values um, and, and maybe uh, within the location uh, with the values of low or high values. Or we try to characterize some areas which have similar values. And in this seminar, basically we want to go into details about why, the, answering the question of why, and it will be in the upcoming uh, uh, seminar series, uh, whereby we'll be talking about the GIS tools uh, in the, and the spatial modeling, whereby we develop different models and try to use these models um, in conjunction with the GIS tools to get new insights from the from the either existing information or the new data collected from the field. Next. So generally the concept is that we try to uh, provide, I mean, statistics, we put them on the map so that we can get the insights. And in this case, we are able to get the new knowledge for a wise decision-making process. Next. So uh, before we go into the Julian, you are, you are muted. Okay, sorry. Um, so uh, before we go into details, uh, I'll just bring you into attention the, the terminologies and the software which we use. Uh, specifically, um, we are using GIS, but what does this mean? It's just an acronym for Geographic Information Systems. We have many definitions, but uh, the general definition uh, is a computer-based system uh, for collecting, 
storage, management, manipulation, visualization, and the dissemination of spatial reference data. And since we use GIS, QGIS is just an acronym for the quantum GIS, meaning that it's a, just a free and open source so cross-platform uh, uh, cross desktop GIS application that supports viewing, editing, printing, and analysis of spatial or geographical or geospatial data. So the details maybe can be found on this site. But what do we mean by the spatial data analysis? It refers to the set of techniques defined to find the patterns, detect the anomalies, or test the hypotheses and the theories based on spatial data. So in this case, um, we'll focus in this seminar, we'll focus on finding the patterns and also detecting the, the anomalies while testing the hypotheses and the theories uh, will be on the upcoming uh, seminar series. Exploratory spatial data analysis is not a new concept. It has been there and it originated from the exploratory data analysis, um, a term which was coined by an American statistician, John Tucky. For those who are doing statistics, I think they are, fam uh, they are, they are familiar with this person. Um, basically, the concept is to describe the statistical procedures uh, used by applied statisticians uh, when they are trying when they are, they were trying to uh, understand the data collected from the field. So it aims at finding patterns and detecting the anomalies. Next. Next. So um, the spatial analytical tools which we use, basically we have two um, tools, that is the Geoda, which is the free and open source software. Um, that serves as an introduction to special data sciences designed to facilitate new insights from the data analysis by exploring and modeling spatial patterns. You can find some details, but basically this was this software was developed by uh, Dr. Lou Anselin and his team at Chicago University USA. So the ARA Studio is an integrated development environmental uh, environment for ARA, for those who are using this ARA, but this is an interface which provides um, opportunity for anyone who is dealing with uh, data, science, data sciences uh, to do kind of programming. And the details can be found on this link for those who would be interested. Next. So um, before I go into details, now I welcome Professor Prosun to continue with this section. Thank you very much, Julian, for your introductory piece of presentation. Uh, now I'll let navigate to the next part of this presentation, which is focused on understanding the drinking water system, because this is the sector where we are trying to have worked on applying these geospatial techniques or techniques. So especially when we talk about drinking water sources, uh, this is especially in the context of public health and drinking water quality. So it's basically governed by the WHO drinking water guideline who sets the guidelines for portable or drinking water which means that it is a water which has uh, acceptable quality in terms of both physical, chemical, and bacteriological or microbial parameters that can be used for drinking as well as other domestic work like cooking. And then in rural, if we look into the rural water supplies or even urban water supplies, so in by and large, it's dependent on surface water, groundwater, or in rainwater harvesting is also being practiced, especially if you look into the continent in Australia, for example, they have a parallel 
setting for harvesting the rainwater, which is more, um, um, it's very obligatory. And even in India nowadays, it is also very um, common to have a practice of rainwater harvest system within the building or built and built context. And, but by and large, I mean, in spite of the fact that we have these three different sources, groundwater by and large accounts for the maximum usage, which means it is about 75% or in some parts, it is even higher that fulfills the drinking water demand, especially in arid and semi-arid region in the Southern hemisphere, the Southern part of the globe. Unfortunately, there has been a, a number of contamination both geogenic and anthropogenic origin, which compromise severely the, the safety of drinking water. And especially if you think about anthropogenic contaminants, they're mostly human induced with specific point source in origin, whereas most of the geogenic contaminants are generally diffused and which are basically being contributed from the different geological settings in, in glo globally. So if we look into the geogenic contaminants in drinking water source, this is from one of our papers, which was published in 2017 on medical geology perspectives on drinking water contaminants. So this, where we, when we talk about groundwater, it contains naturally occurring chemical elements. And these chemical elements are, are governed by the geological setting. If you think about a limestone terrain, you can naturally see that you have high concentration of calcium in the water and related. And, and also on the other side, we also have different elements which are of toxic at, le at toxic levels. So what is important here is that if you look into the diagram here, so we see the geogenic contamination is at the core and we can see that we have natural mobilization. Like where, when you talk about arsenic mobilization or fluoride mobilization in groundwater. And then on the other side, it's also technically enhanced mobilization that covers the mining areas, for example, when we have sulfide mining operations going on. So these, due to this mining, this, the different trace elements, which are in the sulfidic ores or in, even in the mineral, so they, they get dissipated into the adjoining um surrounding areas and they get continue to be to, to be present and in other words these are mostly become almost like a legacy contaminants in these regions and where are they dissipated they are dissipated in the sediments and soils they're dissipated in the atmosphere we, if we think about a volcanic eruption you can have kilometers of volcanic ash which spreads over so you can see these sort of influence and on the other side you can also have hydrosphere if you have all lava flows which was recently in, the, in Spain. So in those lava flows, you can have get into the hydrosphere. And also together with the hydrosphere, we can have the running the different channels, streams, and rivers, which you carry different contaminants and bring it to the, the different parts. So, so effective, what happens then? The third ring here, it impacts livestock, it impacts the water resources, agriculture, and, and all of which on which we are dependent. So human health and well-being. So it is a, the entire human health and well-being is encapsulated within the dynamics of these different geogenic contaminants. And so essentially what is important to know, we need to gather these. First and foremost, we need to do the water quality assessment. That means we need to do the monitoring and to, to have a understanding of the different water quality parameters. And then we have also need to see the potential impacts which will be coming in the subsequently in this lecture now. So, the, so what are the evidence of the potential impacts in different compartments? Like we can also have impacts in the within ourselves when we consume or drink contaminated drink of water waters, or if we have irrigation based with contaminated water, then, then all, all our agricultural producers be, become contaminated. So that's again, we are getting ingestion of these contaminants in, in our body. And then, so, but, and so it's also important to do a critical risk assessment. And that's based on, essentially based on generic health-based guidelines. And there has been excellent, I think Joseph Centeno has been working quite a lot in his earlier days before. So, so and risk assessment is one of the keys to understand these, the, what, what are the threshold levels. 
of, of and then there, there in recent years we have also come up with the recent publication early in 2020 late 2022 and that was on sub threshold values of different contaminants which which can also pose different ailments or significantly affect human health and what are the principal contaminants what we are mostly bothered now is the floor is fluoride is one of the most important which is by, by and large uh, conspicuously found in several continents across the world and second is also arsenic that is also being unresolved crisis which we are going through and then we also have the salinity and different radio nucleides, uranium radon and so so these are some of the major contaminants which we really are looking for apart from that there has also been some of these contaminants we also have these geogenic contaminants which are actually grouped into four broad classes and this is based on Ed Edmondson Smedley 1996 and their classification what they have been talking about is non-essential element for human health which can consist about 44 percent of different race elements and then on the other side we also have some essential elements which are essential for human and animal health about 31 percent of the chemical elements which are necessary at requisite levels and then epe that is these are the probably essential for human health about 14 percent of these trace elements and then we see potentially toxic elements and there we see the see the 28 percent of the most of the chemical elements what you see here so this is the overall bar chart showing the the overall abundances of the in different in each of these categories and and then there's the last one other potential toxic elements with about 14 percent so these also include beryllium vanadium cobalt barium copper boron silicon calcium and chloride so as i mentioned i was mentioning about limestone terrain and calcium excess calcium that leads to the different sorts of human ailments and kidney stones is one of the critical um, classical example of that so if you look into a, any limestone terrain with with groundwater exploitation to a major extent you see these sort of prevalence of these impacts on human health on that way so here what we see here if we look in now focus on full fluoride so then what we can find is if we have a range of 0 0.5 to 1.5 that's the safe the safe range and then if it is less than 0 0.5 which is below the threshold so then you try we, we generally create have this problem or challenges with dental caries especially in the early age the children who are undernourished with fluoride so they could develop dental caries and if it is more than 1.5 then it immediately gives potentially leads to fluorosis both dental skeleton crippling depending on the period of exposure and also the level of contamination level of concentration in the drinking water sources this is the this is a map i think you have seen this in the you know in gsd the BIM from kimambo et al so this is actually built up on uh, the fact that which we see this if you see the local the distribution of fluoride across the world so what we see that we have high pockets we have india in certain pockets we have in major part of sub-saharan africa which uh, julian will speak after me right after this uh, uh, this, this pass and then he, this is essentially denotes the probability of concentration of fluoride above the who conjugate water guideline so we see and but uh, um, uh, apart from these what the shaded parts we also see a huge amount of data which is missing so that's where we see there is no patch or these are mostly white so we need to bridge up these missing data to prepare a comprehensive map on the high fluoride occurrences in, in on a global scale so these and these, these are the facts which really pose significant challenges for the access to safe water and here we what is most essential is the identification of safe and sustainable source of drinking water it's still a global challenge forcing a large population which uh, due to um, alternate sources they're forced to 
continue with them depending on these unsafe sources. And one of the important reason for such challenges that has developed is the fact that the spatial uncertainties, because when we first started working with Arsenic in Bangladesh, for example, there we were seeing the two wells, which are actually within a distance of two hands, I mean, the maximum stretch of hands. One was with high arsenic concentration, other was with low concentration. So these spatial scales, so you see a spatial scale which varies from a centimeter from few meters to several kilometers. So these sort of spatial challenges, this pose huge challenge for the, for the service providers, for the policymakers. So we need such tools which can really pinpoint this, the, test the hypothesis of uncertainties in the occurrence of the possible contaminants and the tools. And then the most important thing is that this special uncertainty is also dependent on the type of contaminant, which severely affects decision-making at various scales in the region. For another example is when we talk about, I mean, since we have worked quite or by more than two decades, two and a half decades in Bangladesh, what we have been looking into the arsenic problem, but at the same time, we also looked into where landed up in, 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 in a concern about manganese concentration in drinking water sources. So manganese is not a toxic element, it is also an essential element, but excess mang manganese is also toxic. So that these are the critical things what we need to explore. I mean, I mean, and this needs to be done. So, and in other words, and so what is essential, this is from the water safety planning perspective. So drinking water safety from catchment to consumer, it's actually deal, essentially deals with knowledge about the catchment and from the catchment and the source water quality. And that is of paramount importance. So unless we establish the source water quality, so we cannot proceed towards this this block of for say, for the provision of safe drinking water. So at the same time, if for example, if you look into the Sweden Swedish perspective here, so we see this the catchment based protection which is mandatory in terms of. So these are some of the and the treatment control for specific contaminants. So we. And this is important that so that the to have a sustainable supply of safe or acceptable drinking water. And then it also needs regular regular monitoring and also understanding the special risk for different contaminants from both from the catchment to the consumer. So in this seminar, now we'll slowly go over to the content of this talk or this semi seminar on QGIS, that's quantum GIS and other GIS tools to address the challenges where we'll present the holistic approach that integrates the QGIS and the different spatial analytical tools to handle the spatial uncertainties for fluoride concentration, because we are in a, in a working worked in a terrain in Tanzania where we have a, a major problem of high fluoride in drinking water, which is going on for several decades. And then therefore the case study we have, which is considered in this seminar, we will more focus on the specific problem, the challenges what is faced in Northern Tanzania within this East African Rift Valley region. So in this, where this geogenic fluoride is one of the safe water challenge, and it is one of the well-known global fluoride belts and about 80 million people who are actually dependent on this groundwater source, high fluoride groundwater, and about two thirds of the household normally exhibit mild to severe fluorosis symptoms. And these are more from prominently seen among the, among the across different um sect sections of the population who have who, who have developed these things and most of the primary source of geogenic fluoride are basically come from different rock types which are mostly of the both in the volcanic origin as well as in the metamorphic rock i mean when we talk about metamorphic rock even talk about the simple phyllosilicate mineral like biotite which are the acts as a reservoir of fluoride in, in which is replaces the hydroxyl ions within the crystal within the lattices and then and these are in in, in when, when they are 
breathe it. So the fluoride is leached out from these minerals, and that comes out and it flows along through the through the groundwater along the groundwater flow path. So we can see such such gems, such sort of features in in in, in the regions. And with that short background, I will now give the words to Dr. Julian again to continue this. Okay, thank you, yeah. Professor Poston, for the uh, an interesting context. So uh, in this part, we will focus uh, on the details, I mean, on the methods which we basically use uh, trying to identify um, these sources and uh, try to identify the high values and uh, try to determine um, some anomalies, especially where uh, locations have high values within the neighborhood of low values. Julian, you have the yes. control. Uh, next, I cannot control. So on this map, basically we try to map uh, the countries with the endemic fluorosis at a global scale. You can see Tanzania is one of these countries. And if you can see, they form some patterns. And uh, um, all of these, 70% uh, of the occurrence of this uh, flu I mean, end end endemic fluorosis is through drinking water sources with the elevated concentration. That is one uh, more than 1.5 milligrams per liter. Next. So um, we tried to look at the, the distribution of fluoride, the variability of fluoride um, in the sub-Saharan countries. And uh, you could see that uh, the idea that they are not normally distributed. And we tried to look at the minimum values. If you look at this, if you look at uh, this figure, this is the cumulative distribution. It shows the minimum values collected, um, uh, uh, collected from different uh, published papers and the gray literatures. But what we were trying to test here to see if these minimum values are uh, normally distributed. But it's unfortunate that if you see uh, this um, cumulative distribution graph, it indicates that it's not normally distributed, and some of the values within this uh, minimum category uh, have concentration more than 1.5 milligrams per liter, which is the uh, maximum admissible uh, uh, concentration for drinking water. The same applies to the maximum uh, values you see in some cases that, okay, the maximum value is less than uh, 1.5 while most of the most of the values are above uh, than 1.5 uh, milligrams per liter but in total we tried to look at where are these disputed basically uh, fluoride has been reported in 21 countries in the african continent and if you look at the variability um, they differ differently. I mean, they differ, um, the concentration differ differently in different countries, which provides another challenge, especially when we try to understand uh, the, uh, the causes of these contaminants, either are they uh, due to the random processes or uh, uh, stochastic processes. Uh, but if you look into details about individual countries, you can see some of the countries, the minimum values uh, are exceeding um, the recommended value of 1.5 milligrams per liter. Next. Yeah, the minimum, the median value within the minimum range exceeds the the recommended value of 1.5 milligrams per liter. And you see here we have a typical Tanzania whereby um, the minimum value in some places, it ranges, I mean, it is up to 40 milligrams per liter. The same applies in some countries like um, 
in some countries like uh, Ghana, In some countries like Ghana, you see we have also the high variability in the forward concentrations. And you can see some of the concentrations can go up to uh, two, uh, 350 milligrams per liter. But here you see the typical case of Tanzania, we have some extreme values, uh, which are around 300 milligrams per liter. And then we can try to think about um, how much it exceeds the recommended value of 1.5 milligrams per liter. So here we try to look at the reported cases of fluoride and also um, the regions, the specific regions where this problem is, uh, is serious. We see that uh, it is uh, fluoride concentration has been reported in around 15. Uh, regions. And nine of these 15 regions uh, have water which is severely affected, whereas six regions are with moderately affected drinking water sources. But still, uh, in some regions, we don't have data. Uh, and maybe uh, most of these regions are within the Rift Valley system. Uh, meaning that some people are depending on fluoride concentration on, on drinking water sources with the fluoride concentration more than uh, 1.5 milligrams per liter. Next. Julian, you can also control. I cannot control. I no? can. I cannot control from here. So here you can see some of the typical healthy problems, which have been, uh, I mean, which are uh, been, uh, which are existing in these regions, whereby uh, for, I mean, drinking water sources are highly affected by high levels of fluoride concentration. The typical one, these photos were taken from the fieldwork, basically when we were doing our studies, our sampling. You see this uh, young, uh, uh, young children uh, who the teeth have been highly affected by dental fluorosis. Whereas some of this, this lady basically is tw was 29 years old, but it, it, she has the, her, her, her legs, which are already uh, deformed because of the high levels of fluoride concentration drinking water. She depended on a spring, a natural spring originating from the uh, from Mount Meru, and the fluoride concentration of this spring was 18.1 milligrams per liter. So you can see these are the typical problems when uh, humans depend on fluoride on sources with the fluoride concentration more than 1.5 milligrams per liter for a prolonged period of time. Next. So um, let's look at the spatial variability of geogenic of geographical phenomena. And in this case, uh, the focus, uh, this is the generic concept uh, of the spatial data. Anything which you observe uh, with uh, location determined explicitly, then you can approach this approach. The concept is the spatial data basically equals to the spatial smooth plus the spatial rough. And in this case, uh, the spatial rough Basically, uh, spatial smooth represents the median and the spatial autocorrelation. We will discuss these uh, terminologies in details uh, or methods of handling this uh, spatial autocorrelation. And the spatial graph basically implies the spatial outliers and the local clusters, which provide an insight about the, uh, the current processes controlling the variability of these contaminants. Uh, within the environment or within the water sources. So uh, looking at this composition corresponds to the first law of geography for spatial data. And this, that is the data equals to mu plus the second, um, the second variation 
the second order uh, variation plus the noise. And in this case, uh, mu stands for the mean, uh, which implies uh, either it can be constant or it can be a trend. And the second uh, order derivation variation basically is the spatial lag variable, meaning that it is just a new value which can be determined based on the observations which you make in the field, whereas the noise represents the measurement errors. So, and under the Gaussian conditions, which basically uh, refer to, I mean, which we refer to in uh, classical statistics that the spatial autocorrelation equals to zero. That means the mean and the variance are constant and we can make the mean to make decisions, but in the presence of the significant spatial autocorrelation, then it's important to ensure that it is taken into consideration in the analysis. Next. So the, the aim of this seminar, basically we try to look at the spatial variability of geogenic fluoride. And in this case, we try to explore the spatial aspects of geogenic fluoride in drinking water sources and investigate the hydrogeological controls, variability and their impacts on the groundwater resources management. The specific objectives in this case is to identify and model the spatial distribution of geogenic fluoride in the groundwater systems, um, especially in the endemic fluoridic regions. And the second objective is to investigate the spatial distribution of the health risk levels emanating from drinking fluoride contaminated groundwater sources. And the last one, of course, we want to go into details about this is to apply the modern geospatial methods and the technologies to develop hydrogeological conceptual model for geogenic fluoride sources and the variability in the, in the volcanic aquifers. So uh, for the objective number one, we have one publication. Uh, one can go um, and look at the details, but here we have specific questions which we tried, we were trying to answer or the hypothesis we are trying to, to test in this case that how do the geogenic fluoride in the drinking water sources vary in space? And do the geogenic fluoride form significant patterns in space and where are such patterns geographically located? So here, if you look on the study areas, where we have three regions that is uh, Arusha, Kilimanjaro and the Manyara, which is in the Northern part of Tanzania. And most of the drinking water sources are, are highly contaminated by fluoride concentration because it, these regions lie within the volcanic systems and the main sources, <clears throat> the main sources of this fluoride is through the volcanic activities and the ge geotonic, uh, ge ge uh, tectonic processes. Next. So the second objective, basically here we focus on the spatial variability of the health risks. And in this case, we had one hypothesis which we were trying to test. <clears throat> that are there places in the study regions where people are likely to consume um, drinking water with the fluoride concentration below or above the maximum admissible concentration of 1.5 as recommended by the WHO. So, and still we have the same case study, but here we tried to look at the, the risks in terms of population who are depending on I mean, who are so depending on groundwater as the primary source. The details of this publication can be found in this paper. Next. So um, the specific <coughs> methods which we used in this study uh, basically is uh, the Molans I statistic, which uh, provides, uh, which is the global indicator of spatial association. The mathematical constraint of this one here basically deals uh, with a combination of observations um, <clears throat> from the field with the location. That means we take into consideration about uh, the observation. 
For this case, uh, here, uh, the Z value, which is the attribute value, basically this is forward concentration. And in this case, we try to look at one of the, I mean, drinking water source, and then it try to test the linear association between uh, what we observe and the nearby source. And in, in, the, in this case, uh, this value or the Molans statistic can take uh, negative one, the value between negative one and positive one. With the negative one, it implies that the process controlling the variability within the water sources is uh, due to the heterogeneous process. But when, um, when the value is zero, it means that there is no spatial autocorrelation and the process controlling the variation of this fluoride is completely spatial randomness. But when we have a positive autocorrelation, it means that um, um, these contaminants are forming clusters. And of course, we wanted to know that where are these clusters located? Next. Next. So an important parameter here basically is the, the spatial weight function because in the presence of the spatial autocorrelation or identification of the spatial autocorrelation, you need to impose the spatial structure. And in this case, um, we have different methods of imposing the spatial structure on the observations. But in this case, we specifically used the contiguity based the spatial weight queen's case. Uh, the, the advantage of this is that it has um, it has the mechanism of recognizing uh, the neighborhood of different position, I mean, different uh, positions defined uh, by, the, by the boundaries. And in this case, because we dealt with um, drinking water sources as the point sources, but in this case, we had to transform them within the QGIS so that we can define the area of influence because what we were trying to deal with is basically uncertain. And we consider what we observe or the drinking water source is the representation of many uh, observations which we could not make. And in this case, we were able to form a, a number of polygons, uh, which we technically called the uh, Tucson polygons, but each polygon represented the area of influence of each drinking water source. So when you look at this spatial weight matrix, uh, the zeros basically implies that <clears throat> uh, the polygon has no, uh, does not share the boundary with the adjacent polygon. But the value one implies that the two polygons, adjacent polygons, are sharing the boundary. So you can generate this one depending on the number of observations which you have from the field. Next. 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 So the second uh, exploratory spatial data analysis was the, the Moran scatter plot. Since the Moran I statistics gives the global indication whether there is a, a, a randomness, spatial randomness, or there is no spatial randomness, or uh, there is a clustering process, uh, the Moran's scatter plot basically provides the mechanism of visualizing this linear association. And by so doing, uh, it, uses, it is used to detect the, what we call the potential spatial patterns. And it divides the observations, what you make from the field into um, four quadrants. The first quadrant uh, <clears throat> implies the high values surrounded by the high values. That means you detect the observations within the set of observations which you make in the field. <clears throat> and in this case, it forms what we call the high, I mean, the positive uh, <clears throat> correlation. But the second quadrant, it identifies the low, the low values surrounded by high values. Of course, in this case, it will provide the negative uh, spatial autocorrelation or heterogeneous process. 
<clears throat> the third quadrant provides um, <clears throat> the areas which have no values, but within the same neighborhood. And the fourth quadrant basically is the area whereby the observations have high values, but within the neighborhood of low values. <clears throat> but the setup of this, um, I mean, the generation of this depends on this spatial autocorrelation. Out Here we have these variables, where, which is um, the spatial lag variable on the y axis. And on the x axis, we have the observed value at a certain location. And the presence of this, I mean, this line represents what I discussed in the previous slide, which is the Milan I statistics. And if there is no spatial autocorrelation within the observations, then uh, the line, this line, the dotted line, will, <clears throat> will be on the horizontal line, meaning that it will be equal to zero. Next. Next. OK, so the other method which we are using is the local indicators of spatial association, or the LISA, what we call the ISA. And we use this one here to identify the significant patterns. And specifically here, we perform what we call the spatial cluster and the spatial analysis by using the univariate local balance I statistic. <clears throat> The univariate local Malanzi stat I statistics basically works uh, based on the Malanzi scatter plot. While this Malanzi scatter plot visualizes the patterns, <clears throat> then the univariate local Malanzi I statistics uh, determines the significant patterns. And in this case, it identifies what we call the positive uh, spatial clusters, that is, um, high values within the same neighborhood. <clears throat> and the low values within and the low values within the same neighborhood but also it identifies next it also identifies the negative uh, spatial autocorrelation that is uh, significant low values and basically these are the spatial outliers that we have extreme values but within the same neighborhood <clears throat> or uh, low values within the uh, low va high values within uh, the neighborhood of low values. Next. So we have this um, by applying the methods which we have described. Basically, we have some of the potential patterns. You can see an interesting feature here. Can I have, okay, an interesting pattern here is that. <clears throat> The results can change based on the spatial weight function which you, you, you invoke or you implement. For example, here we tested, this is the first order, this is the Queen's contributor weight uh, function, the first order, and then we have this one here, which is the second order, and we have this one here, which is the third order and the fourth order. But now the lower um, diagram here, I mean, maps indicated the significant spatial patterns. <clears throat> but what is important, you can see <clears throat> for decision making purposes, especially when you have, um, I mean, you are dealing with the contaminants which are of health concern, like fluoride or arsenic, then you can make the decision based on the potential spatial patterns, uh, pot potential spatial patterns, because <clears throat> depending on the constraints or which you impose uh, by the spatial weight function, some of the information is lost, especially when you apply this spatial weight function. So you can see the pattern will always emerge as you change the order of uh, the contributor weight function. But now what is important is to determine at which stage should you, should you um, obtain, I mean, should you, um, get sensible or reliable observations. Next. So in this case, um, as the rule of thumb, if you look into this one here and trying to look at um, what you observe, especially when you change the order, you can see some of the outliers or the negative 
autocorrelations emerge at the boundary of the significant uh, patterns. So uh, the selection of this one here, because it is through the computational approach, what we use is to look at uh, the computational approach and we use the normalized, I mean, the standardized observations. And in that case, <clears throat> we use the ZD score values together with the P values. And in this case, uh, we, the selection of the uh, sensible results is when you have the high value, the highest, I mean, largest Z score value and the small P value. That's when you can make a decision. And in this case, we had sensible results on the second on the second order of the queen's contiguity, I mean, on the queen spatial weight function. And in this case, you can see we have the spatial patterns in the four red concentrations. That is the high high, which uh, constituted 28% of the sources. And the good thing of this one here, that 92% of the drinking water sources had the fluoride um, less, I mean, above. 1.5 milligrams per liter. <clears throat> Whereas uh, 32 uh, sources were classified as the low, low uh, clusters. In, and most of these uh, sources are the fluoride concentration less than 0, 1.5. Next. So we tried to um, we 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 in this uh, we tried to test uh, further for the probability of accessing safe drinking water based on the method of abstraction. Uh, basically, this is the methods of abstraction. Here we have the drinking. I mean, uh, dug wells. Uh, we have the shallow wells, of course, machine dug. And we have the boreholes and the springs. You can see um, on the high high pattern which we identified <clears throat> we we have i mean most of the shallow i mean most of the most of the drinking water sources are fluoride concentration i mean we're not safe for drinking for example in the shallow wells only one percent were safe if you look at um, <clears throat> you look at this uh, classification and then within the boreholes, you can see only 5% is safe for drinking. For the springs, we have 6%. Uh, so you can see within the part, which we technically classified as the region of fluoride hotspots, most of these drinking water sources are not safe for drinking water. And they present high levels of uh, fluorosis risk. But also when we look at the low low, we identified another problem that most of these drinking water sources, both in uh, drinking, I mean, double wells, shallow wells, boreholes, springs, most of these sources are the fluoride less than 0. Point, less than 0. 0.5. These drinking water sources present another problem, which is uh, basically the dental caries. But also within the QGIS, we tried to associate these spatial patterns uh, with the lithological setting and try to calculate the probability of accessing uh, to safe drinking water sources. You could see that within some of these uh, geological settings, especially in the young volcanic sediments, we could see some sources, but the percentage of accessing the safe source, you can see within um, these um, young sediments, uh, volcanic sediments, 1% and Another one is 5%. The other one, which is these are just the sediments, uh, especially in the lowlands, in the volcanic valleys, is only 3%. But this one here, 50% uh, is within the metamorphic rocks. And mostly they were at the elevated 
um, mountains and some of these constituted of the uh, springs. But <clears throat> generally speaking, you see that in most cases in the region of fluoride phosphorus, most of the drinking water sources presented um, the risk in terms of fluorosis. Looking at the region, I mean, looking at the associating the region of fluoride cold spots uh, with the histological setting, you could see that we have a serious problem in terms of dental caries <clears throat> because most of these drinking water sources had fluoride less than 0. Point, I mean, 0. 0.5. is not moving. So um, we further tried to look into the, um, into the hotspots, identifying what could be uh, the possible sources of these uh, fluoride concentration, high levels of fluoride concentration. So here we see that we had 14 locations uh, within this uh, high, high, category and we tried to look at the mineralogical composition but what is important on this uh, we tried to identify these fluoride bearing phases <clears throat> we could see that we have this titanite amphibore and hornblende and the biotite are the most dominating um, dominating fluoride bearing phases I mean, so um, for the second part here, we used the same methods, but we combined different procedures uh, within the QGIS. And in this case, we used we uh, uh, we used the geostatistical and exploratory spatial data analysis methods. But <clears throat> the variable of interest, which on which we applied these methods, was to determine the fluoride uh, risk levels estimation. And in this case, specifically in the geostatistical methods which we use, the probability cleaning. And we did the prediction because most of the drinking water sources were following the population distribution. And in that case, it was difficult even to estimate the probability in some locations. And in this case, we made an automatic detection of the grid, interpolation grid based on the minimum maximum uh, separation distance between the sources. And in this case, we, we had 1.5 <clears throat> by 1.5 grid. <clears throat> and in this case, um, the risk was determined based on the probability of having a source less than 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. And the risk, uh, the probability of having a source uh, with more than 1.5 milligrams per liter. So the definition of the fluoride level, uh, fluoride uh, <clears throat> risk level in this uh, consideration that fluoride risk level um, equals to the PK and AK, and in this case, uh, PK is the probability of occurrence determined through the probability cleaning, and NK is the total population in the local area. And in this case, we estimated uh, the risk at the one level. And the population data which we used in this case is that the, by that time, of course, it was the recent one, that was the 2012 census data whereby N, in this case, the total number of prediction grids, because uh, after applying the grid, we uh, looked at different, I mean, we had several grids within each uh, administrative uh, boundary at the one level. So we had to use the total number, I mean, the average, okay, value so that we can plug it into this uh, equation to get <clears throat> the probability risk levels. So we used the same uh, procedure of export, I mean, the same methods 
Um, it's not coming. So we used the same procedure. I want to repeat this one, and then um, uh, I go directly to the results. Okay, so here we have the spatial variability of dental caries and the fluorosis. You can see uh, through the probability rigging, we have a number of maps. You can see the locations whereby uh, dental caries, I mean, the possibility of having dental caries, especially where drinking water sources, have less than 0 0.5 uh, milligrams per liter. <clears throat> but here on this map, we have the probability of uh, dental fluorosis. Uh, in most cases here, where we have the likelihood of having the dental, um, the, the dental caries, here it is dental caries, so it's not dental fluorosis, is that most of these areas are elevated mountains specifically within the, escarp the Lift Valley escarpments uh, where water have less than 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. But here, where we have the likelihood of having the dental fluorosis, <clears throat> most of these uh, areas are within the East, uh, within the East African Lift Valley gravel and around the volcanic mountains, especially here we have uh, Mount Hanang, and here we have Mount Meru, whereby most of these sources have, I mean, present the risk in terms of dental fluorosis. But we found that looked at the probability of having the spread of fluorosis. You can see these are just the, it's just a, a lowland, or mostly this is within a plain between Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru whereby this is basically is the leeward side of Mount Kilimanjaro. And this area is a dry area and the evapotranspiration rate and evap evapotranspiration is a little bit um, high in these areas. And mostly um, the population depend on groundwater sources because that is the only alternative they have because of the arid or semi-arid climate. But also we tried to look at the possibility of uh, having crippling fluorosis. <clears throat> Basically, this pattern persisted. And if you remember the map, which I, I mean, the, the, the photo which I demonstrated, the lady was located in these, these regions and most of the sources, some of the sources have even up to 300 milligrams per liter. So um, we tried to look at the spatial uh, variability, especially in the risks. Here we have this risk one, basically represents when uh, the risk in terms of fluorosis. And here we have risk two, this is the risk in terms of dental caries. And you can see uh, using the Milan's eye statistics that there is a clustering process because it is a positive that if we have, it is not a zero. That means we have areas which have high uh, risks and we have areas which have low risk in terms of <clears throat> fluorosis. But also we have the significant Milan's eye statistics as indicated by the Z, Z score. In this case, you can see it is 18, but we have the p-value, which is uh, 0 0.001. But looking at the, uh, the risks, the variability is high in terms of fluorosis when compared to these dental caries. So it implies, uh, this figure implies that the risks are clustering in space. So applying the Milan's I statistics, I mean, Milan's I statistics, the univariate local Milan's I statistics, we could be able to identify the dental caries and just 
located them on the map. You can see this area basically um, is affected, I mean, it consists of most of the, I mean, the likelihood of having dental caries. Of course, we verified this by visiting one of the districts uh, for those who are coming from Tanzania. We have this uh, rombo, we have most of these people uh, have a deficiency of fluoride and they have, they have uh, symptoms of these dental caries. But here you see uh, fluorosis, most of these areas are within the Rift Valley Grabe. And the characteristics uh, in this area is that we have high levels. I mean, we have, uh, it is semi-arid and it is controlled. I mean, the climate in this area is controlled by <clears throat> the presence of this uh, high mountain, Mount Kilimanjaro, and some other, uh, the Western embankment of the Rift Valley controlling the, <clears throat> the level of uh, rainfall within these areas. So these are the typical um, um, characteristics or the problems which are within. And we tried to estimate the population in these areas We around 2 million people at a very high risk in terms of uh, fluorosis. But also we tried to estimate the population and we estimated it that around 1 million uh, around this Mount Kilimanjaro constitute a population uh, with a likelihood of having <clears throat> dental caries due to the consumption for, of, for, of drinking water with less than 0 0.5 milligrams per liter for a prolonged period of time. So in conclusion, um, we have discussed the holistic approach uh, of dealing with the spatial uncertainty in geogenic fluoride occurrence. But this approach is not uh, only for fluoride, this is the application, but it can be used in other <clears throat> uh, fields as, as long as you are considering explicitly the location in the analysis process. So despite of the groundwater, Despite the groundwater provides substantial support to provision of drinking water in Tanzania, its safety is compromised by geogenic problems. <clears throat> geogenic fluoride contamination is highly species dependent, caused by the stochastic processes that result in too much uncertainty when targeting the safe source. But also we have identified that elevated flanks of the major stratovolcanoes and the Rift Valley escarpments can be potential sources of safe drinking water. Some of these sources, <clears throat> especially in these uh, settings, contain extremely low fluoride concentration below, than zero point, below 0 0.05, presenting another problem that is dental carriers risk to communities depending on these sources. So drinking water um, sources in the East African Rift Valley Graben and around the low lands at the foot of some of the major stratovolcanoes are highly contaminated by fluoride. So um, to sum up as the take home message of this, sem uh, this seminar, that any data is complex, like the shape of the earth. So the spatial aspects of the data can affect the decision making. <clears throat> As we demonstrated that one can make a general um, conclusion about the, the problem, the healthy problems, why some of the population or some of the communities are at very high risk, <clears throat> whereby interventions uh, should be given the first priority. So the presence of significant spatial cluster in a data set <clears throat> can be interpreted in two ways. Either inadequate sampling strategy, <clears throat> especially when you have 
a poor sampling strategy or design, or <clears throat> local spatial processes controlling the behavior of an environmental variable. So in the presence of the spatial structure in the, in the data set, conventional methods, that is the mean and the standard deviation may not give optimal results. And in that case, we may opt the optical analytical, the spatial analytical tools and the methods, which basically combine the locational and attribute similarities to provide, I mean, to handle this uh, spatial structure. We have uh, several publications, uh, maybe the participants you can look into these publications. <clears throat> and of course, these publications have been generated for the past five years by using the same methods we are trying to use, especially handling the spatial uncertainty by using, um, I mean, by allowing the data uh, to speak themselves <clears throat> rather than using the traditional ways or uh, traditional ways of reasoning. But um, we are planning to go into details about these methods during the upcoming short course, during the medi, uh, geolo medical geology conference in Mexico. And the topic of discussion will be uh, GIS and the spatial data analytics in medical geology. So we welcome all to participate into this course so that you can understand the details. And this will be having some practical sessions demonstrating the methods and these tools, which we are trying to use uh, in order to let the data speak by themselves, by using, I mean, by testing different assumptions. So with this, uh, I may say thank you for your attention. And it is now time for discussion. Thank you so much. Dr. Centeno, uh, you're mute. Oh, okay. Oh. What I was saying is uh, thanks, Julian and Prasen, for this uh, outstanding and impactful seminar. Uh, this really has been a, 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 a kind of opened my eyes to many issues that we can use in medical geology. You know, one of the areas is that uh, spatial variability of geogenic contaminants you know, in water systems uh, around the world is among one of the most you know, complicated and ch challenges that we faced in the overall chain uh, of uh, keeping and maintaining safe water supplies. And, and your approach really provides us with the tools that we need to uh, determine uh, those geogenic contaminants and, and, and allow for, for very access to, to those uh, uh, the, to a strategies to determine safe uh, water supplies around the world. Logistically, I would like to tell you that I'm impressed by the way that you guys, uh, pros, uh, uh, Julian, you from Tanzania, and President, you from Sweden, have been able to master this uh, this uh, seminar. And uh, I want to, to acknowledge uh, Jesus Oshoa, uh, Rivera, uh, and also Syrah Denise Torres for uh, keeping us. Uh, uh, running on this seminar, you guys have done a fantastic job with this uh, with this presentation. So, with that, I would like to open the floor for questions and comments from the uh, audience. Uh, I'm going to take a first uh, uh, shot at the asking the question to you, Julian and Prasen. You know, I'm I am a toxicologist, and as a toxicologist, uh, my my main uh, uh, interest is to to look at uh, or determine risk, uh, risk assessment, and to use that approach to 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 look at uh, mitigation strategies 
that we can use to assist uh, policy uh, implications, you know, policy making. And one of my concerns will be, or, or one of my questions will be, uh, in your mind, are there any policy implications or actions that we can take to reduce health risk from, you know, related to fluoride contamination? Or, or in, in other words, my, my question to you is, what kind of mitigation strategies we can use to, uh, or implement to, uh, to reduce health risk from fluoride and other geogenic you know, contaminants in, 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 in drinking water? Julian, can I take this answer? Uh, okay, you can, but I can. I will contribute maybe after you. Yeah, no, I mean, just two things I would like to point out here because, I mean, the special analysis, I mean, in, in other words, Julian has really opened my eyes, actually. Uh -huh. In other words, because, I mean, without Julian, we could not have come here. What do we have? <laughs> because of two reasons. One thing, first thing is, that when, when we see a geological phenomenon, which is in other terms, in any geographical phenomenon which is taking place and how it is varying. And in, in, in that, in both in, in, in terms of in uh, spatial extent, which we used to call it earlier, the spatial variability, the, the one which for, for example, what we see on the screen, I mean, how, how we point here, a, a spatial a contaminant here, is going to be seen here and what is the interrelationship between these two points. Mm -hmm. So as a policymaker, if I would say that this is a mine, a gold, this is a Mara gold mine in the background, what you see here. So over here, so in any contaminant which is emanating from here to the <clears throat> to the water bodies down down to the agricultural fields, you can spatially map these things in, in terms of so as a policymaker, I would like to say, what is the source? And then secondly, what is the mode of transport or the mode of the hydro hydrological mm -hmm. setting of the area? So you need to, if, if the spatial analysis will give as a, a basic tool to identify where to put the barriers, so where to put it in, in a way. So that is number one. Number two, when you talk about health risk from fluoride generally, there you can see like some of the health risk clusters what we have seen that here we are potentially risk areas for dental caries with our fluoride concentration less than 0.5 milligram per liter in some areas where it is more than 1.5 there is more risk for as the the end with the fluorosis which is more prevalent so we these these are the things where we need to really look for where to use um, fluoridate the water or defluoridate the water in in general julian you can continue now yeah, uh, in addition maybe to that is that uh, basically um, in order to, to, I mean, to, to solve the problem of contamination or reducing the risk, basically uh, we, we, we try to understand the system, okay? And understanding the system is that we try to look at uh, what we see, I mean, to answer the question that why do we have high values, for example, uh, within the same geological setting, why do we have high values and why do we have low values? This is not different from uh, maybe uh, when one goes to the hospital. If you don't explain the symptoms, I don't think if the, the doctor will give the right dose. Okay, so the same applies here. With these methods, we try to understand the system by looking at where is the source and where does the, I mean, where is the, what is the source? And how does this source, uh, I mean, is it homogeneous? Okay, if it is homogeneous, that means you can tackle that problem. But now, um, and, and the, 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 the other, the, the other, uh, maybe concern here with these such methods that means you can have the site specific solutions you can provide the site specific solutions for example if you look at these maps you see some of the areas are highly contaminated but when you go let's say to the northern part of Tanzania the general understanding is that mm -hmm. we have fluoride and in some locations they they would propose, I mean, they, 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 they say we don't have fluoride in those areas. But now see, for example, with these methods, we identify some areas whereby 
we have the likelihood of dental caries. Okay, that means we have, let's say, uh, less, uh, we have areas where drinking water has um, less fluoride. I mean, it has fluoride less than 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. So under the assumption that there are no, um, there are no supplements because uh, fluoride is essential, that means still these people are at, uh, at a high risk in terms of dental caries. Okay, so in that case, you understand the system, and then after that, you can provide the solution. Like in our case, we are trying to develop these uh, treatment technologies, especially for fluoride and acid. So, but we invested our time to understand what is exactly the problem, because in some mm -hmm. uh, in, in some locations, uh, I mean, they have this technology of <clears throat> of uh, blending water. Mm -hmm. High water, I, I mean, water with uh, high fluoride, I mean, and the other water sources with low fluoride. So they are mixing this water so that they can arrive at a, a concentration below 1.5, I mean, between 0 0.5 and 1.5 milligrams per liter. <clears throat> but the challenge, they don't have adequate water with less than. Uh, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. So with this approach, we identify the locations. I mean, we can optimize the location where mm -hmm. maybe to set the, the blending tank. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So these are just the, the approaches which we can, um, I mean, which can be, I mean, these uh, results are being used. But at the same time, um, in the areas whereby you have, let's say, for a concentration of, let's say, two milligrams per liter. Mm -hmm. Even in the treatment technology, like the dose, okay, you need the right dose, okay, to do uh, optimal treatment. For example, you have a certain dose, which maybe um, one kilogram, let's say, of gypsum, may not be uh, the proper dose to remove fluoride maybe of, 22 milligrams per liter, mm -hmm. okay? So these are just the, uh, how we can make use of this and how we make this one, <clears throat> especially to develop the technology. Yeah, I think that's how I can explain it in addition Thank to- Thank you, what Julius. Doing. Thank you. Now, definitely with some, you know, with millions of people today at risk of fluoride exposure from, you know, from, from contaminated water, these approaches are, are key to understand uh, those uh, uh, areas uh, that have fluoride uh, levels in the drinking water. So this is a, a unique approach and, and I uh, you know, encourage our medical geology community to consider looking uh, at how to apply this methodology and approaches to their own regions where fluoride may be a problem. So uh, any questions for Julian and for uh, Person, well, the uh, if you you can also write the the, the question on the chat uh, if you are uh, if you would like to and uh, and I can just uh, manage uh, uh, read the question to to uh, to Prosom and and to and to Julian. If you have if you have a comment, also is 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 it would be very much welcome as well. Julian and Prasad, there are many Hello. comments here on the chat. Hello. Uh, yes, about... please. Yes, go ahead, Mauricio. Yes. yes. Uh, Very nice presentation. I really uh, want to congratulate uh, Julian and Prasad. Thank you. We we are already have some kind of this problem, uh, this problem in Bolivia, in Santa Cruz, recently just discovered, but still we need to, to address the the geochemistry of the of the fluoride in, in Bolivia. Mm -hmm. So for us, it's very very interesting this this presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, I only want to ask uh, Professor Centeno if you can share with us the uh, link for see the YouTube the YouTube webinars, please. Yes. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, Jesus Ochoa will be 
he's, he was asking you, uh, everyone for the emails and all that. Um, so he can uh, compile the information and send that to everyone by email as well. So, that, so Mauricio, we will, we will share that information with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks a lot. Please. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, I am uh, Professor Nasser Rajami, Saudi Geological Survey. Uh, I would like to ask a question. At the first, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Julian, for your interesting talk. But in your uh, discussion, you only concentrated in uh, geogenic source uh, for uh, fluoride and the concentration of fluoride in groundwater. Uh, you ignored a lot of factor controlling the mobility of fluoride, like physical chemical condition uh, in uh, for groundwater, yes. whether it is confined or unconfined the aquifer, the EH and the BH oxidation reduction potential and yeah. uh, BH would be controlled the uh, behavior of elements in the groundwater. As a climatic condition, uh, the release of fluoride from the geogenic source it is related to tropical, tropical climate or arid climate. So uh, a lot of factor ignored during your discussion. So why you didn't use the R mode factor analysis to collect all the variables and uh, you can discuss this, it would be more effective. Thanks a lot for you. Thank you. For, you do you want to, to start a process? I think this is a very good question, and it was yeah. it, even I am asking this question to me. Thank you for yeah. <laughs> putting. Yes. Actually, we are right now. We are working on the next, our next PhD student, Fanuel. Actually, we are exploring into linking the hydrogeochemical processes mm -hmm. onto these high, high, and high, low, low, high, low, low domains, and try to specifically pinpoint there because one of the important constraints i mean this was testing of a hypothesis when julian joined as a phd student we start, started looking into defining the tools first so and to, in order to do that we the most uh, enriched data what we had was on fluoride so that was just to test the model test the tools so that it functions now once we see these things so we are now funwell is coming up and we are actually in the process of finalizing a paper right now where we are doing mm -hmm. similar exercise looking into the different hydrogeochemical processes what is there so we need to really understand what are the specific high high is of different hydrochemical parameters yeah. and that to get the, and that if we link up with the topography link up with the climatic condition because here it is more or less same climate if you are in, in, in this when you are working in this zone specifically in, in this um, site specific understanding so i mean that is a very good point which you have raised and we are actually working on this i think julian this was on my wish list julian to do this yes <laughs> yes yes i think I, can i contribute more maybe sure. uh, yeah. yeah yeah you if have you been remember, working with other things now yes if you remember in my uh in the first part of this seminar um whereby um i tried to explain this uh the DE square approach, okay? That is the describe, explore, and explain. Yes, this approach. You, if you look, you, you, you see here, we haven't gone into details about the why. Uh, I think that's why a person in uh, many explained that one of our, mm -hmm. uh, our PhD students is uh, working on explaining what are the exact processes which are control, I mean, controlling this uh, behavior. Why do we have uh, patterns? Why do we have low values within the same neighborhood, but within the same geological setting? And uh, here the concept is, uh, sometimes it becomes a little bit difficult if you don't start learning from the data, okay? You learn it from mm -hmm. the data itself. And then if from the data, then you go into trying to test, I mean, to look at what are the explaining factors, okay? And in this case, um, of course, what you said about the, I mean, do, I mean looking at multivariate mm -hmm. or mat, uh, multiple Multivary, variables, yeah. which are, uh, I mean, explaining this, yeah. Uh, we will talk, of course, in details about this, maybe if we have another, another seminar, 
uh, whereby we'll be talking about the spatial modeling, uh, trying to look at different variables. How uh, are they, I mean, how do they explain what we identified as the patterns? I mean, in low, uh, low pattern, uh, high pattern. And also we want to go into details and looking at why do we have a source which has a high value, but within the neighborhood of low values and the vice versa. So these are just the issues of testing different hypotheses uh, using these uh, robust methods and be able to identify what are the, uh, I mean, what, what, what are the key, I mean, what are the, the first, second, and I mean, setting the, looking at the, the, the one which is the more, most influential and so forth. Yeah, that is, I think, um, what I can contribute on top of what the person has explained. Is, is our answer satisfactory? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, no, Actually, Thank it was really good to test this with with yeah. one definitive set of data so now we know that this system yeah. is functioning yeah. so then now we explore i mean it is exactly describe explore explain it's the same hypothesis yeah. we need to move forward yeah. so yeah. that's but definitely it's also we need to understand the local i mean even now with climate change for example if you establish this specific specificities how does climate change impact the continuity of these things so these are well linked so there are many things to really in, in, involve and work out Good. thank you julian uh Prosen. um we have another question uh uh on the chat by damas nyang uh, i'm going to read it but damas if you want to also ask the question you are free to do so uh the mass question is congratulations to presenters for the good presentation However, I would like to know if this system can reduce the concentrations of heavy metals in drinking or from water bodies or other water source whenever found available. If mistaken, you said about fluoride and arsenic. Thanks for the knowledge sharing. Julian, you please answer this question. Um, of course. Um... You have partly explained it before with yes, I explained it because we try to understand the system uh first of all by learning from the data which we have. And in this case, we learn it from fluoride concentration measured from mm -hmm. the drinking water sources. Uh, but the next step is uh to I mean to be able now to look at um uh, how do we optimize uh, this removal of many treatment technologies which we have? Because we are basically using these locally available materials. We are using gypsum, uh, magnesite, um, uh, magne uh, mag uh, magnesite, um, and, uh, I mean, bauxite, and the bauxite. Yes, we have we have three this uh, treatment. I mean, in materials. So we are trying to do optimization to look at uh, which dose is appropriate for which location. It's mm -hmm. all about a site specific solution, not a general solution. Because if I look at the fluoride uh, problem in Tanzania, it has been almost there for a century now. And there are so many technologies which are being tried, but they are not sustainable because mm -hmm. they lack understanding of the system, okay? providing the right solution uh, based on the processes. Yeah, I think that's how we, this system of course will work at some point in time. Good, yeah. okay. If I may add something to that, uh, that you mentioned, Julian, uh, there are some approaches that are being used today as well uh, to look at the use of uh, nano, nano, uh, materials or nanoparticles, uh, for example, zeolites, uh, iron oxide-based zeolites are being used today to remove some of these contaminants from uh, drinking water so supplies. And one of the groups that is doing a lot of research in this area is our uh, medical geology chapter in Mexico. Dr. Hector Rubio uh, research group is working uh, on the use of uh, nano materials based on zeolites uh, for removing 
uh, geogenic contaminants. It's particularly thing, uh, arsenic uh, and other type of, of, uh, of contaminants. Okay. Any additional question for Julian and Prosum or any comment? Okay, so we are coming to basically the last few minutes of our uh, webinar. And again, Julian, thank you so much for this outstanding presentation. Uh, but I just before have to... we end, I, I have a couple of more comments. Oh, um, great, there's a great, wide great, scale great. of applicability yes. of Julian's this, yep, this yep. approach, what we have been looking into. I mean, the okay. number, number of, I mean, this is not, this approach is not only this sector specific. This approach has been used in diverse fields, not notwithstanding even COVID nineteen in China, they have adopted uh -huh. this technique for ma for mapping and predicting this the COVID spreading there. So they have been working on this spatial analysis tool for doing this. That is number one. Second thing, I mean, this is also for disease prevention. Like what we were talking about, this dust, for example, we if we have these uh -huh. volcanic eruptions. And the yeah. trajectory of volcanic ash, how it is moving, and how, how and what are the impacts of that in terms of both water. So you can you can actually monitor a number of natural disaster calamities, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. So you have a, I mean, it, it's a, it's an open playground to apply actually. Yes, yeah. I'm glad that you make that comment, uh, person, because one of the applications that we are working on here in in Puerto Rico is the use of this approach to understand the mobility transport of uh, microplastics. Microplastics. Uh, microplastics. And PFAS also, and PFAS as yes. well. PFOS yes. and PFAS right. from the mm -hmm. source, you know, global distillation tragic trajectories. So we can actually right. do a lot of things using this. Right, now that's exciting, very exciting. So, so again, I have some, then I would like to just to make some final comments to the audience that is, uh, uh, that uh, uh, join us today. Uh, first, I would like to let you guys know that uh, you can visit our consortium website uh, and we will share that website with you uh, on the emails that we were sent. And, and uh, in that website, you will find information concerning not only this particular presentation, but many other presentations that we have uh, made through the uh, 2022 and, and, and other uh, uh, years. And you will be able to uh, look at uh, those presentations, view them, and also download the materials uh, for your research and for your uh, education uh, projects. Uh, as I mentioned before as well, uh, and I would like to thank Mauricio for asking for this, but uh, we will send you all the information concerning the link for YouTube and for uh, Facebook and other uh, platforms in which this particular presentation has been uh, loaded and, and uploaded and it will be shown. Other announcements that I have for you is follow us uh, for the next few international speaker seminar series. The next one will be March 16, uh, and it will be in the issue of microplastics. Uh, what, uh, what are the, the global concerns about this particular area and what kind of research is being conducted uh, to understand and to uh, reduce the uh, exposure to, to microplastics. On April 13th, we will have if uh, our colleague from uh, Africa, uh, Theo Davis, is going to talk to us about medical geology in Africa. So I would like to encourage everyone on this webinar to keep these uh, two dates, March 16th and April 13th, at the same time, uh, 10 o'clock uh, Washington uh, DC time. Uh, and the link will be shared with you as well. Uh, uh, during the next uh, few weeks. So those are two, day, two dates for the next two uh, international speaker seminar series from our consortium. Um, announces about conferences that will be of interest to you. Uh, we are going to be organizing, or it's been organized, 
the atmospheric dust uh, uh, conference, uh, what is called dust 2023, which will be in Bari, Italy, the week of May 21st to the 25th of this year. And on this uh, conference, we are going to discuss everything dealing with the geochemistry of dust to uh, issues dealing with health impacts and risk from dust uh, and atmospheric dust exposure. Um, as Julian mentioned during his uh, presentation, we are also organizing the uh, International Medical Geology Conference, MedGeo 2023, which is being organized by our medical geology chapter in Mexico. And it will be the week of August 6th through the 9th of 2023, uh, Julian and Prosum are putting together a short course on the, this particular area that we just, that they lectured today uh, on August uh, four and five of, of that for the conference. It's a pre-conference short course, and we will be also the, uh, 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 presenting, organizing a short course on medical geology uh, as well. So, uh, if you are planning to attend, please look at the MedGeo 2023 website uh, that was recently uh, uh, published by the uh, Mexican uh, chapter of medical geology. Uh, we have a special issue that our consortium is publishing, which is called the uh, uh, special issue on integrative approaches to medical geology and environmental health. And this special issue is being published by the uh, International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And we are uh, uh, basically encouraging uh, uh, manuscripts to be submitted to this uh, special issue. So please, uh, if, you, if you would like to uh, consider publishing your research, uh, look at this special issue uh, that has been uh, uh, published by the International Journal of Environmental Research and Public Health. And finally, you know, we have different social platforms that you can follow this consortium. You can follow us on Facebook, uh, Twitter, or on YouTube. And, uh, and feel free again to visit our website. And in that website, we publish regularly news and materials that you can use for your research and for your uh, teaching uh, activities. Um, so, with Julian Prosum, you have final comments? No, I would also like, oh. just like to thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity, what we got received, and this experience to be with you all. And essentially, it is more, more or less, I would also like to acknowledge thanks to the CEDA Tanzania Cooperation, which has been behind us to generate this knowledge and in this so that we could present our work which has been we have done and our upcoming i think i would also encourage you to join the phd for um, the thesis public defense of fanuel ligate which will be taking place on 5th of april and we'll be coming up with more information on that soon the exact the zoom links and other things so you're most welcome to join that event Thank and that you. will Thank answer you, some of the questions which came up during this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> which, which you answered really amazing, amazingly well. Uh, Julian, any any comments, any final comments? Uh, no comment is to thank you all for coming and um, I would be happy to see you at the upcoming conference. Uh, I mean, uh, the conference short course uh, where we will look into details about the methods and the techniques on how you can uh, extract uh, useful information from the data by taking into consideration the location. Thank you Excellent. all. Excellent. So there is a, 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 a flyer and also a website about the conference in Mexico, Monterrey, Mexico. Uh, it will be is is published in our website as well. Uh, and uh, if you have any questions concerning that conference, uh, how to how to uh, register all these kind of uh, uh, details, 
please don't hesitate to contact us or to contact the organizers directly. The, uh, these are the medical geology chapter uh, in Mexico and also the International Medical Geology Association. So with that, if we don't have any more comments, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, I look forward to see you again uh, this coming uh, March 16 or April, on April 13th, where you are going to listen to another uh, other uh, speakers that, that, that will be coming for to talk to us about other very relevant topics. Right. So, I, I, I am very excited to see the uh, Professor Santino after a long <laughs> time. Very, very long time. <laughs> it was exactly about a year back when Julie was when I am in Taiwan at that time we have some contact, but after living from a uh, yeah, very long time. Yeah. Good good yeah. to see you, Prakash. Good to see you. Yeah.